So if you have ever shipped a mobile game with another engine, you probably used plugins or frameworks. Because from ad integration to GPU profiling, they can work a lot of magic and make things easier. And if you were looking for a solution for these issues for Godot, look no further because Ramatak is here to solve all these problems. And let's welcome H.P. Uh, Bram, a Godot veteran and founder of Ramatak, to tell you about their work. Thank you. Uh, first small correction is co-founder. There's uh, the other co-founder sits there. Uh, I want to introduce us briefly. Uh, my name is HP van Braam. I'm Peter van Braam. Um, I'm a foundation board member of the Godot Foundation, and I started uh, Prehensile Tales, a uh, Godot um, consulting company that's been around for about eight years now. And my co-founder is uh, Ariel. You might have heard of him. He, re he co-started the engine and has been working in the games industry for decades now. So what do we want to do? We want to make Godot the number one choice for mobile games. That is simply what we want to do. And Godot actually already is a really good choice, particularly for 2D, ga uh, for 2D games, because the 2D game engine of Godot is actually really easy to use compared to the the, th uh, the 2D in 3D game engines that you see like Unity and uh, Unreal particularly don't really have 2D engines. So you end up not using pixels, but like percentages on your screen, and it's actually kind of difficult to use. The same goes for UI, particularly mobile games tend to have quite a lot of UI, buttons, menus, things. They're, they tend to be much more UI heavy than, than PC games tend to be. And Godot's UI Simpsons makes it really easy to make scalable UIs where buttons show up on the right place if you rotate your phone. If you open the game on a tablet or you know an Android phone with like a slightly bigger screen, or maybe one that has like six by nine instead of four by three, or <laughs> what other interesting sh shapes have we seen? Like six by ten, I think, for some of the foldable ones now, or they're like almost four by three or slightly less square. And making sure that your games actually work on all of those phones, and particularly that your UI works on all of those phones, is really difficult in a lot of engines. And this is one of the things where Godot actually already shines, right? It makes it, Godot makes it really easy to make your UI just work across a large number of devices. And then some of the things that is, and this is an interesting point that I oftentimes end up having to make to people who are currently using Unity for, for game dev, and that is that GDScript is actually really good, right? It is actually really quick to make something with GDScript. It is really fast to iterate in GDScript. And it is, um, you never, you're never waiting on compilation, etc. The amount of time saved when using GDScript is already enormous, uh, especially as your game like grows a little bit. So these are the main points that I'm basically already trying to tell to people. It's like, you, you actually already should be using Godot, right? So why, why a company at all then, if it's already all perfect? Well, somebody here earlier today on this stage had a, <laughs> had a brief talk about this. And that is that um, mobile users, in as far as like the open source project goes, as, as Clay pointed out, um, they are actually a little bit underserved, and the reason for that there's there's uh, there's never like one reason for for something like that, but there are several reasons, and I'm trying to enumerate a few of them here. So there are so many goddamn phones, right? And they're all slightly incompatible with each other. I mean, on PC, like. The weirdest thing that can happen to you today on PC is probably something in the, along the lines of this person bought an Intel DGPU. That is the weirdest thing that can happen right now, basically, right? Whereas on mobile, it can be, oh, no, this company actually licensed a 3D VR core, uh, a 3D um, accelerator core from some company in China that nobody has ever heard from here, synthesized that on a MIPS. Uh, on a MIPS core that they got from somewhere else, and now your users are complaining that your game doesn't run, right? So uh, another problem is that particularly on the lower end devices, GPU drivers don't tend to get updated very much. So even if you bought like a phone last year, if you didn't buy one from like the real like flagship companies, chances are that the phone you bought last year has a GPU driver in it from three years ago. 
and there's never going to be an update for that GPU driver. Another thing is, uh, not all the platforms are as easy to develop for as every other platform, and particularly on Apple, it is, it is, there is a big barrier of entry for Godot developers specifically to do this work on Godot, uh, uh, on Godot, because they need to own a Mac device, they need to own um, a phone, and they need to pay Apple $99 a year for the privilege of uploading their own code to their own device. Um, if I sound bitter, that is because I don't like it. <laughs> but it is also a real big hurdle to find someone that wants to do this for free. Because the thing is, particularly working on like an Apple device, it feels like work. It doesn't feel like something you like do as a weekend project to try to figure all this stuff out. So another problem is that most people who play mobile games don't actually have like the most like newest, you know, nuclear powered phone with all the bells and whistles. Most people, most of the time, have phones that are a couple of years old. When they, when they were bought, they were already kind of mid-range. So basically, compared to a flagship today, the phones that people mostly use are basically like as fast as like that flagship was like five years ago, right? And by the time we have contributors that are interested in working on mobile games at all, it's usually because they're interested in mobile devices. So these people will have like an iPhone 45 and, and whatever it is that is currently the newest stuff. So there is a mismatch there as well because it is not fun to try to see what your latest eye thingy can do and then actually what you need to do is try to figure out how to make like a, a square move a little bit smoother on the device with like a 30, uh, for a 30 hertz refresh rate screen and like terrible colors, right? So what do, so what, what we just talked about is what do Go developers want, but what do game developers actually want? And this is something that, you know, as CEO of a mobile uh, uh, tooling company, I have some ideas in now. So <laughs> there are several things that, that people are concerned about before picking Godot for their next game today. Although those concerns are far less now that Unity has you know, decided to uh, take away a lot of people's uh, livelihoods. It turns out that that was quite a big motivation for a lot of people to at least consider a different engine. So the top thing we hear is the performance on older devices because I will get into that a little bit later, but if you're trying to sell a game, or rather you're trying to get people to play your game, because that is, tends to be how the actual monetization on mobile games works, the only thing you really care about is the number of people that have it installed and the number of people that are playing it. And in order to get your game on as many people's phones as possible, it needs to run on basically everyone's phone. Right, so this is a problem. This, the, the second, um, point is related but not the same as the first one because they also want to make sure that they're not getting a lot of support requests, particularly games. So free-to-play games support requests are kind of rare, but once you start adding in-app purchases to your game, now people are going to be kind of angry if uh, they purchase something and it doesn't work on their device. So device compatibility is quite important. The other thing is um, there's a lot of frameworks that are used on mobile, particularly the bigger the studios are, the more of these frameworks they tend to have. But they basically fall into ad and monetization plugins, in-app purchasing public, uh, plugins, and, and frameworks for analytics. Like, the user spends three seconds hovering his finger over this button before clicking it, things like that. There's a lot of like A-B testing that happens in mobile games, far more than I don't know how many people here are actually mobile devs, so I maybe <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, am I uh, saying anything weird so far? <laughs> um, and um, it's it's a lot different than than like PC development as far as like the, the process of getting your game played by people goes. So what are what is the biggest um, challenge then is basically to take the experience from this on this device to making the user feel that they have this, <laughs> right? And there's different ways of doing this, but there's a couple of things that we need to remember when we talk about performance on mobile, right? 
one way of thinking about performance on mobile is, is can it run crisis, right? But the thing is, almost no mobile games are crisis. In fact, most mobile games, as far as like the technology stack goes, is slightly closer to Pong than it is to, uh, to crisis, right? So when we make choices about what we need to um, optimize for um, mobile development, we need to keep this in mind. Um, so, uh, to reiterate a little bit, to stay in business as a mobile dev, you need people to play your games. Because you need people to play your games, because you need people to watch the ads that are in your games. And, in order, and for people to watch the ads, to, uh, uh, they need to have the game on their phones. And in order for it to be on their phones, it needs to run on their phones. Sadly, most of their phones are crap. Right? So here I have a screenshot of um, the Google Play top grossing on the left and the top for zero dollars on the right. And if you look through like this list, what we see is that on the top are 2D game, 2D game, 2D game, uh, isometric 2D game, 2D game, Roblox, <laughs> <laughs> and another isometric 2D game, right? So the, 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 the breadth of sort of like that, what we can cover with the 2D engine in Godot and, and making really sure that that works really well is as far as game content types go is six out of the seven top seven grossing games could have been made with Godot, but they're not, sadly. So one way of doing this is uh, going back to the future, <laughs> and that is um, by having a highly optimized GLES2 renderer for Godot 4 in order to make sure that we can run these types of 2D workloads on basically any device that can run, that can render a triangle, essentially. Um, Another nice benefit of this, because this is a thing that a lot of just Godot users have complained about lately, is that this will also reintroduce the ability to export your game to WebGL 1. That's for mobile developers not that important, but for game jammers it is very important. Because that means that you can upload your game jam game to itch and have people on Mac devices actually be able to play it in their browsers. Right. Um, right now, though, we are focusing the ES2 renderer entirely on 2D for the uh, things that I hope I didn't belabor too much <laughs> in the previous slides, which is that most of these use cases are 2D, as, as you can see. Uh, another thing that we've kind of touched on so far is that most mobile games are monetized with ads. Um, there is uh, the... the, the um, Sorry, lost the word there. Uh, the economics of mobile is, is quite a lot different than on desktop. Like on desktop, it's usually you either sell your game for free, sorry, you give away your game for free on Steam and maybe you sell like a soundtrack or maybe some DLC. Um, but it's all basically you're selling something and, and you're either using the game as sort of like a um, loss leader or you're, uh, or you're just straight up selling a product, right? Whereas on mobile, most of the time, most players are not interested in paying anything upfront. Uh, and there the, uh, the business model kind of forks into, right? One of them is kind of similar to the Steam model, which is that there's like in-app purchases to like buy levels, upgrades, whatever. And the other one is simply monetizing it entirely through ads. And um, in order to make that work, um, there's a lot of analytics that needs to happen because you need to figure out, okay, are people clicking away uh, from the game because they're like, uh, there are too many ads, are there, uh, do people click away from the game because it's too hard, do they not come back if it's too hard? There's a lot of uh, a tweaking that happens in mobile games, sort of like even, um, even when they're live. Uh, one of the features, for instance, of um, Firebase, if people are aware of that, is the ability to send a little bit of JavaScript or settings of games through the database as well. So where uh, developers can do things like, oh, this level, uh, people tend to uh, exit the game after this level and not come back, so it may be too hard. And then you can actually just go into your Firebase database, change the setting of hardness from six to five and see if more people make it past that level, right? There's a lot of sort of like feedback happening in those things. 
Um, the other thing is that a lot of these libraries are not open source, which means that as far as sort of like the Godot project goes, and I think that is correct, by the way, as foundation member, sorry, as foundation board member, I think that is the correct approach for the foundation to take, and that is that we're not going to like be shipping like a particular mobile ad SDK with the open source engine, right? Because first of all, who would we pick? Uh, and second of all, what would they do with that power, right? Could they then, uh, make us uh, uh, make the project go in a particular direction because now we're like financially dependent on them in some way. You know, it's it's a big mess. Um, but the the downside for that is is that right now people who use Godot for mobile tend to have to write these integrations themselves or use uh, community um, plugins for it, which is fine. I mean, there's obviously nothing wrong with community plugins, but if it's not your job to do that, then, then the ad plugin does exactly what you need for your game, and that might not be the same as what the next user needs for their game, particularly if they're not as technic technical enough to write the plugins like that themselves. So, um, an additional difficulty is, is that there are very many ad networks around. Um, there are ways of making this a little bit simpler. There are um, ad networks that do something that's called mediation. But what it basically ends up doing is, is okay, you're going to mediate all of your ads through, I don't know, Google. Uh, but you're going to get ads from Meta through the Google. But it does mean that Google is now taking some extra money from you, right? Um, Another problem is, is that you can't usually really get away with only ever supporting the one ad network for your entire for your game forever, because if you if your game goes global, it is very likely that you could get significantly more revenue from your game if you had a different ad network in say Asia compared to the U.S. compared to um, EU, South America, etc. There's different ad networks that just pay out differently based on where people come from. So it becomes quickly the case where as a developer you're, end up, you're going to end up having to support four, five, six of these yourself um, and all of the different code paths through your game to you know, um, talk to these like, different APIs that all have slightly different impedance differences, etc. Another one is um, if your game has been out for two years and was made on Godot, you know, I don't know, Godot 2.1, I'm just gonna say something silly. Um, and now your ad network folds, but your game is actually still being played. Now it's your job to go in, find a build of Godot 2.1, make you see if you can still get like the Android Studio version required for that particular game to actually work. Write a new ad plugin for a game with a source code or with a with a code base you haven't seen for a cat lab for a couple of years just to you know make sure that your game keeps actually generating revenue. Um, you will find that for the, a large part of the time, the developers cannot do that. Right, so these games just slowly one by one start falling off the app store, um, and that is I think unnecessary. At least that we we have a solution hopefully. Um, so what do, we, what do we propose to do here? Uh, a single API for ads. So give me an interstitial ad, give me a reward ad, give me a whatever type of ad you have. And make it so that picking whatever, or the network that displays the ad, pick it at the time of exporting your game, which means it is a decision you make after your game is already done. That I think is the important point here. That also means you can easily generate different builds of your game because you know the Godot export system is really flexible. You could just have multiple different export presets for the different ad networks that you want to support in different regions. And crucially, making sure that it all has the same user-facing API between iOS and Android. Meaning you don't have to like worry when you're writing your game on what platform you're even going to end up distributing it. Right? Um, Another thing that that gives us is what I just talked about, is the ability to support older games much more um, easily. Because Apple and Google are kind of fickle batmates, right? They might decide tomorrow that uh, uh, API version 3.57 is now a no-no on, uh, on the App Store, and now suddenly your game is going to disappear next week. 
And now you have to figure out how to rebuild your game for the new ad version, uh, for, for the new uh, API versions. Uh, ad networks themselves also tend to change the rules a little bit. Like what content is acceptable for like certain categories of games, etc. So you can suddenly find that your game that was doing like really well for the last like five months suddenly just stops getting ad impressions. And what do you do then? Apart, do you, do you really your best recourse at that point is to just change ad networks because trying to figure out why that happened, unless you're a very big developer, is really difficult. And again, and who wants to dig out that you know two or three year old game in order to figure this out? So one way we propose to solve that is by a build service that uh, uh, that we will provide, where you basically just place your entire game in a Git repository on our end, and whenever such platform changes occur, we just build a new APK and a new AIP for you that you can just download, put back on the app stores on your own credentials, because we've tried to see if we could automate that, but particularly Google is not particularly forthcoming with APIs on how to do that uh, automatically. Um, and this also means, because we are doing the export for you, that you could create different export presets for different ad networks and other things. And when we add new ad networks, you could just go into a web UI and select a different ad network for one game or 10 games, whatever, uh, whatever you want to do. And, in, and I think most importantly, it means that um, as a game developer, like someone who actually sits and codes games, you're not going to get bothered by uh, someone trying to make money from your games on Actually, we need this ad network plugin in this old game like now because it's still making money and now you're not working on something more interesting, which is probably the new game you're making, right? So uh, to tie all of this together, we have a product that we call uh, Ramatak Mobile Studio and we kind of refer to it as a distribution of Godot. So kind of like how Linux has different distributions like Red Hat, SUSE, Debian, you've probably heard of one of those. Um, we are trying to be a distribution of Godot in that same way. So we take Godot um, and make sure that when you install it, it just works, right? Because we found, uh, and this is something that I think most people who have tried to do user support uh, for this part of the engine have found, is that quite a lot of end users of the engine that are not as technical as like the developers are, are actually struggling with things like Oh, I want to export for Android, so now I need to install an Android SDK. Oh, in order to install an Android SDK, I need to have a Java version installed. Oh, in order to export to Android, I need to go and create an Android debug key so that I can then sign my APK and put it on my phone, right? And for all of us, this is like something, okay, you've, do, you've done this once 10 years ago and you just sticks in your mind and it's fine, or you just look up that one command that you need to type in to make the, the, the debug SDK, right? But if you're a beginning developer or a developer that doesn't necessarily come from mobile, these things actually allow, stops people from doing, uh, from even beginning to try to use uh, Godot on mobile. Um, so what we've done is we've basically taken um, all of these sort of like choices that users had, and we've basically just taken them away. Y you don't get to pick where your uh, Android SDK is installed because we will install it for you. You don't get to pick what version of Java you have installed on your computer and where because we just ship a Java to you, right? And same goes for the debug uh, key store. Debug key stores, they're all the same because they all need to have the same username and password. There is no need for a user to generate one because generating one is always the same for everyone. So the first time you press export in the Ramatak Mobile Studio where you don't have a debug key store, we just fucking make one for you, right? <laughs> and a lot of this stuff is... Um, kind of sim like sounds kind of simple, but it's actually really difficult to do in upstream because for, we are developers. Well, some of us are developers. <laughs> and, and we do want those choices, right? Like when I install the Godot open source project, I don't want it to go and download a, a Java uh, uh, because I already have a Java and I don't want it to install an Android Studio because I already have one, right? And I don't want three or four on my computer. Um, so it is very difficult to sort of like do this, all of this upstream. We're trying to make it easier. Like we've tried to make things like detecting this a little easier. But then you run into the problem that um, 
users are very creative in the ways they manage to break their systems. Um, <laughs> like, um, I think that one of the most fun one was there was a Java installed on that Windows system and the Java home was in fact set correctly to a path that once held a Java installer and there was even a java.exe but nothing else. I uh, try to detect that situation, right? It is very, very difficult. And not even that, what is Godot's, what, what are we as, as an engine supposed to do in that situation? How can we detect, okay, yeah, but you seem to have a Java, but also it's kind of broken. I mean, are we now supposed to, like, what, what error can we even give other than, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and we're trying to avoid that <laughs> uh, response by just making sure that it can't break. Um, by that same token, that's also why we actually don't let users download their own export templates. Once you install the Ramatech Mobile Studio, it just comes with the export templates that correspond to that Godot, uh, to that Godot version. I totally understand why the open source project doesn't do that, but again, this is a change that the open source project is not going to take, right? Because we have that system for a reason. Um, so I just want to make one thing clear, though, with this, uh, with what we're trying to do. We really do not want to fracture the Godot ecosystem. It is very important to me personally that a Godot project made in Ramatak Mobile Studio will open in the corresponding open source Godot version and vice versa. Um, the whole embrace, extend, extinguish thing is we do not want to do that. <laughs> and we want to make sure that uh, whether or not people use the Ramatak Mobile Studio is because they think it's better and not because now they can't use Godot anymore, right? It is very important. So where is the product today? Um, you can go to ramatech.com and download the version now. Um, it's currently based on Godot 3.5 and has out of the box support for AdMob and Meta. We have Windows and Linux editors and we can export to Android. Uh, Mac OS and iOS is coming very, very soon now. We, had work, we were working on that yesterday evening still. Although I would have liked to announce that we have it today, but sadly we had some Xcode linking errors that we have still not quite, <laughs> quite explained. <laughs> um, we have improved support for, prof uh, for profiling tools. You can ask, uh, thank Jakob for that, He's sitting right there. And same for some uh, GLS3 uh, performance improvements. We've, uh, uh, there was a couple of unused ES3 extensions that like, don't matter as much on desktop that turn out to matter a lot on mobile. So we've implemented those in the ES3 renderer. And I believe that is up, the work is upstream, right? Uh, or is it PR at least? Okay. So to, to repeat that real quick. <laughs> yeah, to, to make that real, uh, re re uh, repeat that real quick. Some of it is already upstream, all of it is PR, some of it is still being reviewed. And uh, as I said, we have support for managing Android export keys. It goes a little bit further than what I just said. What I just said was we generate debug key stores for you. We, we do do that. But we also have a key manager with sort of like, with manages key stores separate from your, sp from your app, which allows, if you're working together with four or five people, allows you to do share a key store, configure that key store in Godot, and now everything you do uses those key stores. You can select different release key stores, et cetera, from the export um, settings instead of pointing it to a key store file and having to type the username and password in. We're basically keeping all of that uh, separate for you. So what is coming soon? Um, the pluggable uh, backends for in-app purchases as well, because currently we have the ad stuff, but not the AIP stuff, and the same goes for analytics. So we want to make sure that you can also pick your analytics uh, um, plugin at export time, same as your in-app purchases. The changing in-app purchases may sound a little bit alien to some people. Um, but on Android, it is not that uncommon because people deploy to uh, Amazon Store, people deploy to Play Store, and there's various other third-party brokers for this stuff. Uh, on iOS, that is not yet the case, but um, given that the EU has uh, stopped being amused by uh, Apple's uh, claim that they have, no, no, we're not one company that sells like a web browser. Uh, we're actually six companies because we have six different branches of the web browser. So that's not going to work. So they're going to have to allow other people to sell stuff on, on their devices. And then the built and maintenance service that I just talked about. 
um, slightly further out the Godot 4 base release because currently the project is based on Godot 3 with the uh, ES2 renderer for 2D games. Some compatibility improvements for the mobile uh, render device renderer. Render device renderer. Probably should have phrased that a little bit differently. And um, Oh, I put the build maintenance service twice. Sorry, that is actually closer than that. My apologies. <laughs> and uh, Mono and C-sharp builds, because currently we, we only support GD scripts. Slightly further out, uh, GD script native ahead of time compilation, making sure that uh, your GD script games basically run about as fast as like 75 to 90 percent of uh, of C sharp games, and something uh, a new type of ad con uh, co uh, concept that. Um, we currently have code named native ads, and I just want to like to show you real quick what that's going to look like. So the idea is to turn ads on mobile that work like this <laughs> into something that's a little bit more like this. And talk to us if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in for your games. So how do we plan to sell this stuff? Well, right now the pre-releases are free. If you go to ramatuck.com slash download, the version is free. We're not gonna cripple that later. If that works for you and you never need anything else, then you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, once we're feature complete, we'll have a free version with no upfront cost and a, a ref share. A pro version, kind of like Unity does, it's yearly upfront cost, no ref share, and an enterprise version where you get support options as well, together with the SaaS features. I think I'm actually done a little bit faster than I said, uh, thought, so I think I can at least help you guys get back on track, because my next slide is asking for questions. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, we have a second mic for the question for the Q&A, so if anyone has a question, just signal me, please, and I will come to you. How do you intend to, maybe it's uh, industrial secrets, but how do you intend to, to like, support the game like much later than like the the build release like for I released my game for 3.5 and then in five years like what like when I upload my sources to your service uh, will will you tweak the sources yourself like in your team or it will be like upstream with the API that will change the things yeah so um, there's a couple of things sort of like hidden in that question, right? One of them is like the ad APIs. Well, that is entirely our problem and the whole point of, of having the abstraction is for you to not have to worry about that, right? So that part we take care of, but the thing is we have to take care of that anyway because there, there is no point in having an abstraction API that breaks every other release because then you might as well not have it, right? And the other one is the actual um, Godot sources itself. Well, because we, we need to support uh, like particularly larger customers for a much longer amount of time, we, we need to be able to build like Godot 351 against the Android NDK, you know, current plus five anyway. So that is something that we will have to be doing anyway. Um, so for us to then take that work that we're doing already and package it up to something that you can easily use is just an, an easy extra step for us to take. Does that answer your question? Okay, we have two more questions. Um, I'll first go to the back and then to you. Thank you. Sounds very interesting. And right now it's supposed that uh, I build a game, it runs, I upload it, and uh, the Android build right now, and it's upload to the store, it's handled all by, all by Ramatak. So um, the uploading to the store, we cannot do. Um, the There is not really a good API right now to allow us to use your credentials to upload to the store without us having your credentials. And that is something that I just don't want to do. So the, the situation right now is that you, you, you uh, have a game that is using the, uh, the build uh, uh, maintenance service. And whenever a new build is ready, you will just get an email or Slack AM or WhatsApp message saying that your builds are ready. And then you'll have all your APK IAP files and you can just shove them into the store. So the, the, 
it is automated right up to the point of you actually uploading it to the store. Can you repeat the last one? So well, I'm trying to understand what is build uh, maintenance ser service. Not entirely got it. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Maybe I was not. I was not clear. Uh, my apologies. Um, so, if you're if you're exporting your game, right? If if you're working by yourself for yourself, then it's probably not that useful for you. But if you're working in a larger team, then having a central place that does the builds that just gets you an APK, gets you an IAP file for it to deploy on test devices without everyone having to do that locally or you're having to pass around things to do that, is pr it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the other thing is uh, we make sure that your Godot 351 game will still work on Google, on, on the Play Store once they've you know, bumped the API version past where Godot 351 supports. So the open source uh, so the, the the open source project, like at some point, stops doing that, right? Like we we will never give you a version of Godot 3.5.1 that has that is built against the Godot sorry against the Android NDK that was released yesterday. We will give you a 3.65 a 3.65 that is, but not a 3.51, right? Um, so there's there's always a little bit of risk and a little bit of work involved in upgrading your game to make sure that it can stay on the on the app stores. Um, we're taking that work away and ask you to pay for the for for the help, basically. But this is all optional. I hope I made that clear. This is all optional. You do not have to use that. If you get the product and you press export on your computer, you, it will work the same as Godot. You you will just get the APK or you get the Xcode project, and you don't need any like cloud infrastructure for this to work. I want to make that very clear. This it works the same as Godot. Thank you. Uh, could you show again the um, example of the new type of ads you've integrated in the game? It was a bit fast. Sorry? It was a bit fast, so I didn't quite yeah, see it's, it's how it was made. Yeah, it's a little bit of a teaser, rather, because I don't want to go into too much details oh. about it, right? But I can show it again. It's not a secret, obviously. <laughs> okay, and how would that in, uh, be made with the um, um, ad providers? Sorry? How would would this work with the ad providers? Like you would get special textures, or um, can the ad providers provide content for this type of ads already? Yeah. Oh. Well, not already. That is this is something we're working on because this is a bit of a chicken and an egg problem, right? We need people to integrate the ads in their games in order for people to want to buy places to put those ads in. So that's the chicken and egg problem that we're trying to solve. But yeah, the the general. The general point is that as far as sort of like the monetization model goes, it works the same as video ads, which is you have ad spots and people have ads that they want to put in the spots. It's just that the ads are not videos, they are mini games. So um, we know that web games and mobile games, they can surge in traffic and users very quickly, right? So a streamer, uh, sudden said, "Hey, let's check check this out. Let's ch let's check this game." Um, my question is, are the clients when uh, when they when they display the ads on on your game, are they gonna hit your a your abstraction API um, directly, or are they gonna bypass your API and hit the vendors APIs? That's a very good question and um, something I was not very clear on. My apologies. So the a the ad API I'm talking about is an in-engine API to abstract across um, ad providers, right? We do not like Ramatok does not try to interfere with that at all. Once you've picked AdMob. As far as like your game is concerned, you and, and as far as AdMob is concerned, you now just have a game that has the AdMob SDK in it and has all of the normal AdMob trimmings. Same for Meta. So once the game is exported and you've made that choice, the fact that there is an abstraction API doesn't matter to you anymore. Like the only thing that matters to you at that point is that you could have Meta and Google Ads if you want it at the same time, for instance. Welcome. Thank you for the question, because I should have been more clear on been more clear on that. 
I see we have one more question at the front. We still have a bit more time, so please don't be shy if you have questions. Uh, I was wondering, so far you have only talked about ads in mobile games. What about ads in browser games? We have not really thought about that, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> If we have no more questions, we can also end a bit early and you can uh, grab HP once we are done and ask the juicy questions in private. <laughs> like more about this native ads, for example. Why did Rush recall us? <laughs> uh, yes, why, would, why did he recall all of us? Well, I guess we will, uh, you will have to ask him later. Uh, we'll ask, have to ask them later, I'm very sorry. Uh, thank you all for being here and let's thank AP, HP again for this presentation. Thank you for coming. <laughs>